no witches were harmed in the making of this episode. Human beings, just like you and me, with hopes, dreams, and feelings, were horribly and slowly tortured to death by psychopaths claiming some silent, invisible sky wizard told them to do it. Welcome to Satan is My Superhero. In this episode, we return to a former subject of this podcast. And tear another chapter from his life story. We first met Cotton in the episode A Pox to You, where we compared the modern anti vax movement I'm positive vaccines are bad. I've seen the memes. to its 17th century forebear, the anti inoculation campaign. Sounds a lot like witchcraft. In that episode, Cotton was the voice of reason, the man of science who stood up to superstitious misgivings and disinformation. He was, not to put too fine a point on it, the hero of that story. So how does our man of science and reasoning acquit himself at the Salem Witch Trials? Damn you to fire! Fucking hell, Cotton! Yeah, it's not good. Spoiler alert! Why are we tearing down this hero we built up in a pox to you? Well, because all heroes must fall at the feet of... Spooky Month Special! It's Witches, Bitches! Cotton was born in 1663. His grandfather, Richard Mather, had been a famous Puritan minister, theologian and author. Cotton's other grandfather, John Cotton, was a famous Puritan minister, theologian and author. Cotton's father, Increase Mather, was a famous Puritan minister, theologian and author. Cotton would go on to become a famous Puritan minister, theologian and author. Cotton was what we today would call... An ignorant arsehole. No, a Nepo baby. That's what I said. Cotton became a student of Harvard when he was 12 years old. No, Cotton wasn't some kind of Doogie Howser-type genius. His dad was president of the school. It was bring your son to work day for six years. Cotton would also go on one day to become president of Harvard because he's... An ignorant arsehole. No, a Nepo baby. That's what I what said. What you said, I... I got it. Cotton's first officially recorded encounter with witchcraft came in 1688. The 25-year-old ordained minister was asked to offer his expert opinion in the trial of Irish washerwoman Anne Goody Glover. To be sure, to be sure. That's so, um, racist. I feel like it's not okay. Okay. Glover was working for the Goodwin family and had a disagreement with 13-year-old Martha Goodwin. I told you to use fabric. Off now, you stupid mick. Oh, to be sure, to be sure, Miss Goodwin. That's racist. Not like me accent, but to be sure, to be sure. <laughs> it's funny. Immediately after this run-in with Glover, Martha began demonstrating classic signs of possession. I demand to speak to the manager. Soon three of her siblings were showing the same symptoms. We, we demand, demand to, speak to speak to the, the manager. manager. Looking for the manager. <laughs> Alleged doctor Thomas Oakes did the only logical thing and immediately diagnosed witchcraft. Hey, Doc, I've got a sore back. It's witchcraft. Oh, well, what about my son's runny nose and persistent cough? Witchcraft. And my daughter's rash? Witchcraft. I can't believe some people spend years in medical school to do this. Cotton spent much time with the children, even having Martha live with him for a while, and interviewed Glover in prison, whom he described as... An ignorant and scandalous old woman in the neighbourhood, whose miserable husband, before he died, had sometimes complained of her that she was undoubtedly a witch. What, did you just call me? Witch. I said witch with a W. You bitch. Cotton concluded there could be no doubt about it. Glover was definitely a Catholic. I mean, witch. Definitely a witch. She's an outsider and no one to protect or avenge her. Let's have a pernicious cruelty party. I mean, let's carry out a serious and methodical investigation into the very real possibility of witchcraft in the service of our sincerely held religious beliefs, which we all definitely, very definitely believe in. With the good reverend seal of approval, and Goody Glover would be the last person to be executed in Boston for witchcraft. So yeah. All right, guys, we've got to stop hanging people for witchcraft. Boo. I know, I know, we've had a lot of fun, but it's time to stop. Boo. Can't we just do one more? <laughs> okay, one more. <laughs> and then that's it. Boo. Since it's the last one, 
Let's go big. Woo! Let's do a white woman. <gasps> Irish. Irish white. Yeah. 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 Cotton published. Memorable providences. Detailing the entire case and his part in it. Dear reader, please find herein upon these pages as I have written upon their surface in ink most humble words describing my heroic deed. This is not I from memorable providences. No authority These are not the actual words of the reverend. Language this is garbage. Angry please don't listen. Hi ladies. Hi You're currently enjoying our brand of comedy. Join us on social media. Visit SatanIsMySuperhero.com And follow the links. And now, back to a time when America was great again. Was great again. Was great again. Four years after the Glover case on January the 20th, 1692, 11-year-old Abigail Williams and 9-year-old Elizabeth Harris started demonstrating the classic symptoms of demon possession. We demand, we demand to, speak to speak to the, the manager. manager. Abigail and Elizabeth happened to live in a little village called Salem. Wow, I didn't see that coming. Some other village girls, including one Anne Putnam Jr., joined in on the shenanigans. It's not fair. How come Abigail Williams always gets to be possessed by the devil? An alleged Dr. Griggs did the only logical thing and immediately diagnosed witchcraft. It's witchcraft. Within a month, three local women had been arrested and Arthur Miller's The Crucible began writing itself. Uncle? Susanna Walcott's here from Dr. Griggs. Oh, the doctor. Let her come. Let her come. Come in, Susanna. What does the doctor say, child? He thinks you're all a pack of spoiled assholes. But he's willing to play along. <laughs> a court of local leading white men was convened to preside over what would become known as... The Salem Witch Trials. Three of the five judges were personal friends of Cotton. In a May 31st letter, Cotton tells those judges he is too unwell to travel to Salem himself, but offers this advice. I must humbly beg you that in the management of the affair in your most worthy hands, you do not lay more stress upon pure spectre testimony than it will bear. The spectre testimony Cotton is referring to is when so-called witnesses claim to have seen the accused witch in a ghost-like form. Cotton does not discount spectre testimony entirely, but he does advise caution when dealing with it. What he is very hot for is a confession. The very best evidence is forced confession. Nope, hang on, I, I said that wrong. The best evidence is forced confession. Hang on, I'll, I'll try that again. The best evidence is for Scott. This, this isn't working. Let me reword this. Uh, you'll get the best evidence by torturing the forced confession out of her. Nope, nope. Come on, Cotton, you can do this. Don't say the quiet part out loud. I might have misrepresented Cotton there for comedic purposes and because Cotton deserves it. But here is what he actually says about forced confessions. I am far from urging the un-English method of torture, but instead thereof I propound these three things. I will save you the time of wading through Cotton's writing style of using hundreds of words when three will do, and tell you his preferred methods of confession extraction, but just before I do... Can we ruminate on this phrase? On the English method of torture. Maybe I didn't misrepresent the good reverend. It's not how white people fight. Anyway, Cotton made his three preferred methods of confession extraction. Method one. There's a good chance as soon as the trial begins, Yahweh will step in, you know, like he does so often with so many things during our everyday lives, and cause the demon possessing the witch to just leave them to their fate. Later, bitches. Method two. The witch might have some kind of tick or compulsion they do regularly. This behavior may be the link to the demon. Stop them doing this weird thing and the demon will leave them. Wow. By beating my stutter out of me, you've exercised my demon. Oh, really? No, I'm, I'm still possessed. You bear. Wink, 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 Method three. I'll let Cotton's words speak for themselves here. 
I should not be unwilling that an experiment be made whether accused parties can repeat the Lord's Prayer or those other systems of Christianity which it seems these devils often make the witches unable to repeat. Devils often make the witches unable to repeat the Lord's Prayer. Hmm. Foreshadowing. On August 17th, Cotton sent another letter to the Salem judges, this time pressing hard on his spectre testimony concerns. Whereas his first letter had been quite wishy-washy on the subject, he now suggests everyone convicted purely on spectre testimony and nothing else should be released. If the semi-translucent incorporeal spirit doesn't fit, you must acquit. In Cotton's letter, he asked the question... If the holy God should permit such a terrible calamity to befall myself as that a spectre in my shape should so molest my neighborhood as that they can have no quiet, although there should be no other evidence against me. As Salem has got more and more out of control, I think a certain young reverend had the realization... This shit could happen to anyone. Just two weeks before this feverish letter from Cotton... Salem's former Puritan minister, George Burroughs, had been arrested. This shit is happening to anyone. Now, while Cotton did not actually attend the trials, he certainly turned up for the execution of aforementioned Burroughs on August the 19th. As the former minister stood on the gallows, Burroughs recited the Lord's Prayer. (gasps) According to Robert Califf, who we'll discuss soon, this threw the crowd into a bit of a tizzy. Which is can't recite the Lord's Prayer. Well... It was lucky Cotton had attended that day. According to Califf, Cotton sat on his horse and convinced the crowd it was okay to change the rules whenever it suits their bloodlust. And anyway, he didn't say always, he said often. Often, often, often. He's right, you know. It would be a shame to waste these gallows. Gallows? It's a step ladder under a tree. Yeah, but someone had to carry it all the way here. Satisfied by Cotton's added words to other words to create new facts, they not only still hanged Burroughs, but went on to do another four accused witches that same day. Are you guys going to be much longer? I need my ladder back. In October, the wife of the colony's governor, Sir William Phipps, was accused of witchcraft. Days later, Cotton's influential father, Increase Mather, denounced the use of spectre testimony. Picks or it didn't happen. Governor Sir William Phipps, whose wife had just been accused of witchcraft, suddenly banned the use of spectre testimony in trials. Governor Sir William Phipps, whose wife had just been accused of witchcraft, suddenly shut down the trials altogether. Governor Sir William Phipps, whose wife had just been accused of witchcraft, suddenly put a stop to any more arrests. Look, guys, it was all fun and games, but now it's affecting me. With the murder factory getting closed down around him, the head judge in the trials quickly ordered the immediate execution of the witches who had previously been exempted from state-sanctioned murder due to their pregnancies. Come on, just one more, please. Governor Sir William Fitz, whose wife had just been accused of witchcraft, blocked this order. You never let me have any fun. Governor Sir William Phipps, whose wife had just been accused of witchcraft, then released the 49 witches being held on spectre testimony alone. Amongst them, five-year-old Dorothy Good. I was guilty the whole time, you bitches! If you're imagining an emotional reunion between mother and daughter as five-year-old Dorothy Good is released from prison, don't. Dorothy's mum, Sarah, had already been murdered by the righteous mob of Christians three months earlier. Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and thought, Jesus Christ, I'm an evil piece of shit? Because if you haven't, then neither have I. But if you have, can I suggest you try Christianity? Christianity, come for the bigotry, stay for the bottomless pit of serpent-tongued hypocrisy. Christianity is brought to you by Christ Incorporated. Christ Incorporated is a subsidiary of Yahweh International. Stay stupid and keep hating. Stay stupid and keep hating. Finally, in 1693, 16 months after it all began, Governor Sir William Phipps, who, I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, his wife had actually been accused of witchcraft at the peak of the blood orgy. Anyway, May 1693, Phipps, whose own wife had been accused of witchcraft, pardoned and released the remaining accused witches. See you later, witches! Fanboy of cruelty, Cotton was given all the court documents from the trial. Cotton? Why are these pages stuck together? 
He then published his own book on the subject titled Wonders of the Invisible World, being an account of the trials of several witches lately executed in New England. In it, he defends the use of spectre testimony. We had to use spectral evidence because witchcraft isn't real. No, no, hang on, I said that wrong. We had to use spectral evidence because witchcraft isn't real. Uh, hang on, I'll, I'll try that again. We had to use spectral evidence because witchcraft isn't this isn't working. Let me reword this. Uh, there is no real evidence for witchcraft because we made it all up. No, no, come on, Cotton, you can do this. Don't say the quiet part out loud. Cotton would spend the rest of his life facing criticism for his part in the Salem witch trials. As we discussed in A Pox to You, his reputation was very much ruined in many sectors of society. And his involvement in inoculation was a factor in it being first rejected by Boston's scientific community. This inoculation sounds a lot like witchcraft. It's not. Oh, really? Can't you sweep aside your personal feelings for me and try it? I would love to sweep aside my feelings about you, Cotton, but I can't. Because no one in this colony owns a frickin' broom anymore. In 1700, Boston merchant Robert Califf published a refutation of the wonders of the invisible world. His book was titled... More Wonders of the Invisible World. He just added, more, to Cotton's title. Not quite the burn he thinks it is. Califf was concerned Cotton was only just getting started with Salem, and in his words... Let loose the devils of envy, hatred, pride, cruelty, and malice against each other, yet still disguised under the mask of zeal for God. Caliph had been publicly attacking Cotton as far back as the Ann Glover case, and Cotton had threatened to sue him for libel. I am going to sue you for libel, sir. I promise you, this is now my number one priority in life. Absolutely nothing else is more important to me. I shall not rest until I have seen justice done. You know, to sue me for libel, you have to prove I'm not telling the truth. You are very lucky I am too busy to sue right now. Believe it or not, Cotton went on to author nearly 400 works about all sorts of stuff, from theology to science. He even wrote a children's book. Here is my beautiful wife reading that book to our youngest. They which lie must go to their father, the devil, into everlasting burning. They which never pray, God will pour out his wrath upon them. And when they bed and pray and hellfire, God will not forgive them. But there they must lie forever. Are you willing to go to hell and burn with the devil and his angels? Seriously? That's what you read to me right before bed? What the (laughs) fuck is wrong with you? (laughs) Just act like I'm reading lines off a script? What? Why is that hard? (laughs) Oh dear. In a diary entry later in life, Cotton opined the reputation as a bloodthirsty witch hunter he had created for himself. Everybody points at me and speaks of me as by far the most afflicted minister in all New England. Persecution complex. Harvard alumni, Puritan historian, and the man Margaret Atwood dedicated Handmaid's Tale to, Peter Miller, describes an older Cotton as a man haunted by his past and... Panicky lest the Lord take revenge upon his family. If there is a just God, I'm completely f***. As for Salem, in 1697, a day of fasting and soul-searching was ordered, and one of the judges, Samuel Sewell, publicly admitted mistakes were made. I mean, who hasn't arrested and tortured 150 people? Am I right? High five! Come on, guys, don't leave me hanging. In 1702, the trials were declared unlawful. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Whoops, a daisy. Whoop, whoop, whoop. In 1706, Anne Putnam Jr. apologised for her part in the whole affair. Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> In 1711, the colony pardoned all those convicted and paid compensation to their families. Sorry about your mum and dad. Here's 50 bucks. 
and in a 1752 attempt to distance the place from its shameful past, Salem Village was renamed Danvers. Danvers is Latin for we had nothing to do with it. It's not Latin for we had nothing to do with it. That was a joke. Did you know 100% of our Patreon supporters have never hanged anyone for witchcraft? Hmm, food for thought. Visit SatanIsMySuperhero.com Follow the link, support the show, and prove to the whole world, once and for all, you don't hang people for witchcraft. Do it today. It's the only way. What can we take away from... The Salem Witch Trials. Whether it's reds under the beds, lavender scare, satanic panic, QAnon, it's all just the same people doing the same thing with a different label. And I would have got away with it too if it were for you meddling kids. The best way to think about these people was summed up 323 years ago by our friend and posthumous colleague Robert Califf. If the bigots willfully and blindly reject the testimonies of their own reason and more sure word, it is no more than what I expected from them. And that's why Satan is my superhero. If you've enjoyed this episode, rate, review, subscribe, you know the deal. But please do go check out the website, satanismysuperhero.com, where you will find links to the merch store, our Patreon page, and all our social medias. Boo.